This is Support is Sexy, Episode 6, with New York Times bestselling author, Deneen Milner. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. So, Deneen, thank you so much for joining us today on Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yay. So I have to ask you the question that I open up and ask everyone with. Um, When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Um, It was probably when we decided to move to Atlanta. Um, And that was back in 2005. We lived in New Jersey. I'm originally from New York. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I had two daughters at the time. And we just decided, you know what, we're not getting to be the kind of parents that we want to be. And it's impossible to do that when you're doing the rat race of New York, New Jersey, right. running back and forth to work and, you know, hurriedly dropping your kid off with a nanny or at the school and then coming back just in time to see somebody, you know, put them into the bed. Right. And that wasn't going to work for me. I'm way more involved mom than that. My husband is way more involved dad than that. And we just started getting stressed out to the point where it was making me physically sick. Mm-hmm. I had um, had um, pre-diabetes. I was diagnosed with uh, as a pre-diabetic, and I don't like needles. Right. So I was like, <laughs> you're like, no, this is not going to work. This is not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all like being brought on by stress, which is the crazy part. Stress, lack of exercise, and bad eating, all of which is a recipe for a hardworking mom trying to juggle way too much. And so we just decided, why are we here? If we have Wi-Fi and uh, a laptop, we can write from a foxhole. Right, right. So it's like, well, let's make our foxhole Atlanta where we have family and support and, you know, a less expensive sort of nut to meet every month. And, you know, just move down to Atlanta and see what we can make a go of it. And so we did. And... So many doors opened up for me, Elaine. It wasn't even funny. Mm -hmm. You know, all of my friends thought, okay, you're a writer. Why would you take yourself out of the center of media? The media media capital of, exactly. But you were like, this is my health and my family. Absolutely. And so it was like, I, I can make this work. So I had enough connections before I left to be able to not only sustain myself, but to make more than what I was doing working every day. Um, going back and forth, you know, sitting at a desk for the man. So, (laughs) (laughs) and what around what year was this that you made the move? That was 2000 and it was 2005, 2005, and mm -hmm, and, uh, April of 2005. By June of 2005, I had a book deal, and then by August of 2005, I had another three book deal. Wow, so. And I moved down there with a column um, that I was writing for a parenting magazine, which I had edited while I was working for them. So when I raised my hand and said, I'm leaving, they very graciously offered the column to me, Mm -hmm. which paid me pretty much the same amount that I was making if I were working there full time and commuting and paying for lunch and buying nice clothes, getting my hair done a specific way, (laughs) a specific way in the office, like it all, and paying a nanny, it all worked out to be the same exact amount that I was making if I were still living in New York, running back and forth like a fool. Right. There's, so there's, I was like, this entrepreneurship is kind of the this ball. Is working. I know there's so many things that you said in there. One is that you did it at a time right now. Everyone's trying to do that or doing that working from here and there, but you did it at a time before it was as popular as it is now. So that took Absolutely. courage to say, you know what, we can make this work from wherever. Absolutely. And, I, you know, like, I don't take what we did lightly. It was not an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. We had to sell our home. We had to make sure that our children were, um, 
you know, were set. They were five and two at the time. So they were young and they weren't necessarily totally tied to where they were. Of course, they felt bad leaving their friends, but they were young enough that they would be able to go somewhere and make new friends. And plus, you know, they had their mom and their dad who okay. were going to be with them all the time. But everyone thought that it was just an odd thing to do. We moved to this big old pretty house in, in a place called Snellville, Georgia, mm-hmm. which is well. <laughs> <laughs> where in, in the town, uh, in the town Kroger, there's a big wall that says where everybody is somebody like, you okay. know, it, <laughs> it's that well, kind of. It's, it's that kind of place. We don't have that in New York. <laughs> right, right. No, not at all. <laughs> and, you know, our friends are like, you're moving to the country. You're, you know, you're taking yourself out of the game. How are you going to make this work? But we knew that we needed to step out on faith and trust that the footsteps that we had laid on this long path didn't end where we were. Like we had to think bigger than, um, you know, where we were, which was a very big, glorious place for two journalists, Mm -hmm. particularly African-American journalists. He was running a magazine. I was working at at a huge magazine, one of the few black editors at a mainstream magazine. We were doing great and writing books on the side. When That's when it's hardest to leave, when you're doing great otherwise. Absolutely. But you have to trust that all of the the, 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 the foundation that you built is going to allow you to do even bigger things. You can't ever stop thinking, um, you know, there's, there's more to this than what I'm doing right now. I think, too, another thing that you mentioned that's, that's um, important is the, the idea that once you did decide to leave and make that decision, other things started to show up. Sometimes we think if I leave this, nothing else is going to happen. This is going to be, you know, the end of life, basically no other job, no other opportunities. But then parenting said, hey, how about a column? And then your book deal and other things started to roll out. Absolutely. I had more work than I could handle. I was writing freelance stories for Essence and Ebony and Jet and Money Magazine and Parenting, then writing the column for Parenting every month. And then they added on a, an online component when they got their um, website together. And then I was writing for other websites. And then I created my own space, my own website which opened up even more doors. And then I was doing partnerships with different brands that wanted to work with me because I was focused on black moms. And then on top of that, I was writing books. It was crazy. I, you know, like I really was juggling way more than, um, you know, what probably could have been considered humanly possible, but I needed to do that. I needed to prove to myself that this was a good move, that it was a good business decision and that I could take care of my family, having taken myself out of what everybody thought was the game and moved to a place where everybody is somebody. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you created a new game. I love it. So tell me now, you grew up in Bayshore, right? In yes, <laughs> in Bayshore, New York, in Long Island. Long Island. With, um, Long Island. I'm a Long Island girl, too. Hi. <laughs> where are you from in Long Island? West Hempstead. Lake oh, you. my gosh. I went to Hofstra. Okay. You, right. Right around the way. I love yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So what was it like growing up, Deneen? What were you like as a child? Oh, I have grown so much, honey. I, I really, I really have. I was um, very much like my older daughter, Mari. Um, quiet, super studious, um, really, really smart, um, very shy. I had friends, but, you know, I was the one who would stand around and hold the coats mm-hmm. and, you know, like, stare wide-eyed while they were having all the fun, right. you know? I'll hold You're your like, watch. I'll just be like, over like, here. Like, dive off the bridge, right? <laughs> exactly. I'll sit on the bench and watch the things while y'all go have fun. That was me. Um, I was, uh, you know, my self-esteem was really rather low. Um, I grew up at a time when um, dark skin wasn't, you know, celebrated yeah. when kinky hair wasn't celebrated, when having a bubblicious black girl body wasn't celebrated. It felt like everything was going against every inch of who I was. Mm-hmm. Like, if you weren't fit into this really sort of super narrow box uh, that pop culture had created specifically for women and girls, then you were considered ugly. Now, maybe... Or invisible. Or invisible, right. right. And 
And maybe people didn't feel that way, but it sure was the way that I perceived it. And, you know, for the longest time I hid. It was like, okay, so instead of being invisible, I'll just hide. So I'll be quiet. I'll, you know, keep my head down and I'll do my work and I'll do everything that my parents tell me that I'm supposed to do to succeed. So my mom was very, um, very strict. She's, you know, Southern Baptist woman. Mm. We were in church all the time. Um, she had a strict um, sort of code of, of morals and conduct that you had better, you know, like walk that line or there was going to be a problem. Right. And I, I had a really, and my, my mom passed away when, um, uh, in 2002, mm. about three days, about three weeks after my youngest daughter was born. Oh. My father's still alive and he's still my best friend. And he was the one who um, just was always like, come on, baby, let's go and, and you know, pay some bills. And, right. you know, like, <laughs> very happy to sit shotgun in his El Dorado and right, right. ride all around town with, you know, with my dad and holding his hand in the mall and, sitting down and eating ice cream and talking about people walking in front of us. Like I just led a very sort of quiet um, existence. And I can say now that it made me who I am. It took me a long time to sort of pull myself out of being invisible mm -hmm. or hiding. Um, and I, I have to say that I didn't stop doing that until I had little brown girls of my own. Mm, so not until you were an adult, you felt like I have to show up now. Absolutely. You know, like when you're looking at a baby who looks exactly, exactly. like you. And she looks exactly like you. I mean, exactly <laughs> like you. Right. Like we can walk, I could walk down her high school and people will say, you're Mari's mom. Right, you? right, right. <laughs> we look exactly alike. Um, how can you possibly look in your child's face and think ugly? or something less than perfect mm -hmm. or something that does not work or that doesn't fit or needs to be hidden. I could never look at that baby and think that way. And if I could look at her and see her as beautiful, there was no reason why I couldn't look at me and see me as beautiful. So, hey, you, buddy, quiet. He's telling um, you, you're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my He's co-signing. <laughs> and so, you know, I just, um, my daughters helped to raise me. They really did in ways that I would have never been able to do if I weren't looking into those faces and seeing myself. Mm, that's yeah. beautiful. Now, who would you say were, or what would you say were some of your influences growing up? Oh, definitely my dad and definitely my mom. Um, we, we had a very tight family. It was just me, my dad, and my brother, Troy. Um, Are you older or younger? I'm younger. I'm the baby. Me too. We the same story. I'm the baby too. I'm a daddy's girl too. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. There's nothing like it being the baby and the daddy's girl. It's yeah. the best, the best place in the world to be. Exactly. <laughs> um, so you know, my mom and my dad, that they they weren't educated folks. They didn't go to college. My dad um, didn't even get to finish grade school. Mm. Um, and but they they thought education was extremely important. They understood that just because they couldn't have it when they were younger um, was that was even more motivation to make sure that their children got it. And so, um, you know, my parents were, you know, like, there's no reason for you to come home with these because you're smart enough to get A's. Mm. We know that you get A's. So get A's. Right. And I was OK, I'll get A's. <laughs> I'll get A's. Right. <laughs> but you said I'm smart enough to do it. So I'll do it. Um, you know, they were just always just super supportive. My mom would walk me down the middle of the aisle at church, you know, just waving like my baby's on the honor roll. No, when, right. <laughs> when they give out baby, the awards, right? right. I said, That's my boo. That's my baby. Like I love she's it. just supportive. And the community that we had around ourselves, I have to say that the community that they built of friends, the community of friends they built in our church was a lively, lively community that was so incredibly supportive. Mm. Like, I don't go to church now, but I do miss the community that we had when I was growing up. I, ha I was surrounded by aunties and uncles. Right, everybody knew you, everybody looked out for you. Absolutely, you were afraid to do something wrong because the shame was real. Right. You were happy to do 
good things because you knew that you were going to be celebrated. You knew that you could stand up in front of people and have a big church solo and everybody would support you. Right. And, and if you were warbling and exactly. cracking. Exactly. Even if you notes. couldn't sing. Right. Like, like, sing, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. Shake the kid, shake the tambourine. Like, you better sing that song. <laughs> exactly. Right? right. There was that support that, that showed you how to be, you know, stand up in, on uh, third Sunday and, and answer questions that about your lesson that you learned in Sunday school. Um, you know, on fourth Sunday was Youth Sunday and you run this, the church service, right. the place of worship. You, Chico Benjamin played the piano. <laughs> Not Chico. Mm-hmm. Right? Chico <laughs> Benjamin played the piano, and Kelvin said the prayer, and, you know, I did the the, the, Sunday, uh, the Sunday school lesson and, and led folks to the Sunday school lesson. Black History Month came, and, and we took turns giving Black History Month speeches. That's where we learned how to be, mm. how to represent and present. And... I, there's nothing like um, being a black child in a place where you're supported and loved unconditionally and chastised too to make sure that you don't do wrong or you learn how not to do wrong. Right. Learn how to love God fiercely and you learn that, that moral code, how to be kind, how to be patient, how to be honest, how to be trustworthy, how to love someone and understand that they can mess up the be forgiven. Mm-hmm. You know, all that I learned right there in the pews of, of St. John's Baptist Church at the knee of my mother. Mm-hmm. And that was the hugest influence that a girl could have ever asked for, because that was the place where I learned how to be. I love it. So when, did, when would you say that writing as a gift, because you truly have a gift, when did that become apparent to, uh, to you? Was it when you were a child or as you got older or was it always a part of your life? You know, when I was in, um, I guess it was ninth grade, um, I had a, uh, an epiphany. I wanted to be an architect Hmm. (laughs) and I would, you know, make little, um, turn little boxes and crates into little homes and I would create these fantastic sort of indoor spaces and create bedrooms and dress them and all kinds of things, even, um, I even did a few contests. I built a solar house with my best friend at the time. I really was into it, but my physics grades suck. (laughs) I am not good at math at all. It's math or science. Oh, at all. At all. That is not my forte. And so I came home with yet another B in physics or maybe even a C. And my dad was like, look here, this this architecture thing is not going to work out for you. Because like, this um, is not your gift. This is not your portion, baby. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you gonna have to figure out what you can do with the rest of your life because architecture is not going to be a thing for you if you can't do math and science. You have to figure out how to make the building stand. Right. Exactly. Right. So, um, so he's like, "What do you want to do with the rest of your life?" In the ninth grade, I'm in the ninth grade, being asked, wow. "What do I want to do in my life?" By my father. And we happened to be sitting down at the table and there was a little, like the kitchen table, and there was a little teeny weeny TV on the table. And so I'm from New York. There was this legendary um, newscaster named Sue Simmons who worked um, at, on NBC News. And she had this, this show called Live at Five. And on Live at Five, she would interview celebrities. And right at the exact moment that my dad asked me, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Sue Simmons was interviewing New Edition. Oh. Now. You like whatever she does. Whatever she does. To be able to she, interview New Edition. She's talking to my man. Ralph Tresden is going to be my husband. We're going to have beautiful babies <laughs> together. And we're going to make a lovely, lovely life right here in Long Island. Right. So, so, so I was like, I want to do what she does. And he was like, okay, so tomorrow go to school and figure out what it takes to become Sue Simmons. And so everything that I did was geared toward becoming Sue Simmons. I went and I found a radio show. I found out that we had a radio station at my school that was student run. And all you had to do was have some records and some free time after school and you could have a radio show. So I went and I got a radio show and played like the SOS band and Loose Ends and Funkadelic and 
So I did that. And then I, there was a media class where, where um, if you agreed to stay an extra period after school, you could be a part of this class. It was a two-period class. And they taught us how to use editing equipment, cameras. We wrote um, openings to basketball games, like theme music. We did everything. It was a really, really great experience. And then I worked at the, the yearbook, and we had other places where you could write and take pictures and things of that nature. So you and were so seriously I, all in with, like, I'm going to do what, cause, uh, because Ralph Trisvan. Because Ralph Trisvan. <laughs> exactly. What? Like, not even a game. Like, okay, <laughs> no, I'm going to do not what. Not a game. Yeah. I'm going to be Sue Simmons because Ralph and I were meant to be together. And so the very next day, I figured it out. And all of that sort of culminated, not into meeting Ralph Tresvant, but definitely into getting a scholarship from my local newspaper um, to go to school. Uh, I went to Hofstra University for, on full tuition scholarship. Mm. And a part of that scholarship was writing for uh, Newsday, which was our local newspaper, right. during the summers. And that's when I realized that I could write, writing um, op-ed pieces and things of that nature for them while I was interning, getting coffee, they were letting me write. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like, oh, I'm, I'm halfway decent at this. I didn't realize that I could really write my face off. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I, I haven't started admitting even that until recently, that I actually am a good writer. I've been doing, I've been getting paid for my writing since I was 17 years old. I right. got my first check when I was 17. Um, But it was when I was working at the Daily News um, as a political reporter, um, and I had written something, and I I got in trouble for for writing it, because at the time, the owner of the Daily News was trying to work out some kind of deal with the mayor at the time, who was Mayor Giuliani. He was trying to buy some property. And so they were really trying very hard not to be critical of the mayor because- How corrupt he, media to, is, right? Thank you. Be very clear about it. This is not new. This is all just the way that it all works. Right. And so they were trying to do some things together, and I was doing my job. Right. I found, found out something. I can't even remember what it was, but I wrote the hell out of it. And got into trouble for writing it. Wow. For doing your and job. Doing my job. I got in trouble for doing the job that I was hired to do and being paid very well to do. And I was really upset and crying and like, you know, maybe this is just not what I'm supposed to do with my life. Maybe I'm not a good writer. And it was my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, Nick um, Childs, who's also a writer, who said, why are you listening to them? Like, you're the best writer in that office, like you can write circles around those people. Right. Why letting them make you believe that you're not good at what you do? Mm-hmm. Like you know what this is? This is like politics. This is not your talent. There's two separate, distinct things happening here. Don't let what they're saying about your job affect how you feel about your talent. And it was when he said that that it just clicked. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> right. I can write circles around these people. Exactly. I'm really good yeah. at what I do. It made you realize it's not about you. It was about what they had going on there. Absolutely. And it was right then that I decided I need to do something to get out of writing politics. I'm very good at this, but this isn't what I want to do. I want to be able to write my face off. Like mm. I'm a stellar journalist. I can find out dirt on you in a heartbeat. Clearly. A, that's why they were like, oh no, this is not going to yeah. work. Absolutely. I'm an old school journalist, honey, before Google, you know, existed before. Right. You actually um, had to do the research. Absolutely. Before cell phones existed and you had to find somebody in the yellow phone book and, you know, go and leave a message on their answer machine right. waiting for them to call you back and not being able to write the story until you had three experts to back up which every line that you were writing. Um, you know, I knew how to do that. I still do. But the writing was what really just turned me on. There was an art to it. And I, I figured out then that I, I knew how to paint with my words. Mm. Um, but it wasn't until... Recently, I think when I um, I wrote Jesse Norman's memoir, she's a world famous opera singer, mm-hmm. 
And I talked her into letting me write her book. I knew nothing about opera, not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I did the, the interview with her, she, I had to interview with her. She had a couple of people that she was considering. And I was sitting in my hot car in the park, in the, the driveway at my dad's house. He lives in Virginia, in a small town in Virginia. And it was hot and I had the windows rolled up and I didn't have the air conditioner on because I, I had her on speakerphone. My dad's reception was really bad and his Wi-Fi was really bad. So I had to do it from the phone in the car. Right. In the And I was like, I don't know anything about opera. I've listened to one opera album in my entire life and it was by Kathleen Battle. And it was because I wanted my baby to hear all different kinds of music and black folks creating. Right. But opera has not been you know, one of the, the music musics that I've chosen to listen to regularly, but I know you, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in a, you know, my dad's circular driveway on his land that he was born on and raised by his grandparents and his parents. And his country is all get out here. <laughs> and my dad grew up in segregated South and we are on the land that his family tilled on the land that they created their own way out of no way because no one would give them the chance. Segregation, Jim Crow segregation, racism in America stopped them from being who they wanted to be, but they still managed to make a life for themselves, the life they wanted. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what you did in Augusta, Georgia. So I talked this woman <laughs> into you like, I can write your story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And for me, writing is way more than just putting words on a page um, and being able to write sentence structure and, um, you know, being able to make it coherent. Writing is being able to communicate with other people. Writing is being able to hear someone's voice and mimic it or emulate it. Writing is being able to put those words on a page and paint them in the same way that an artist would, um, a painter would paint a picture, a, a portrait of flowers, and knows how to put the blue just in the right place to create that shadow, and the yellow to bring the sun light over um, that flower in just the way where it makes sense where that shadow was created. I do the same thing with words. It's creating a piece of art. And with Jesse's book, I created a piece of art. And I, you know, like for the, it was the biggest challenge ever because I had to learn opera music and be able to speak about it fluently. It's a whole nother language. Mm. Be able to speak about it fluently to one of the greatest opera singers of our time, of our time, not black artists of our right. time. One of, of the time. greatest opera singers of our time. And I had to be in a fluent opera, operatic conversation with her about her music, about her life, about where she grew up, about her passions, and then be able to take that and paint her a very specific picture. Um, and that's when I realized, oh, I can write. <laughs> right. This is that. That's <laughs> no, when, I was going to say, when did you realize that it was that thing? Like writing was that thing. Would you say that was that time? You say, you know what? This is it. That was exactly it. When I wrote that first paragraph, and which is everything to me, I can't like skip around and write, you know, the last chapter and then write chapter three and then go back and write chapter one. I can't start unless I write the first paragraph, the lead. And when I wrote that first like three or four paragraphs, I knew, uh oh, I'm about mm -hmm. to turn this out. <laughs> you like this feels <laughs> right. I, I, I can write. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you think made her say yes? Do you think uh, it was the relation to the story about your dad, or what do you what do you think it was? Of course, you might not know, but I, you know, she never told me, but I I suspect that it was a story that I told her about my dad. I think I I, I hear through the grapevine that I was up against a white male culture critic, and it was between you know someone who knew opera very well. And probably could have figured out the sort of black woman, segregated South, Augusta, Georgia, rose to fame at 16 in Germany. He could have figured that piece out. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that it was um, me being a black woman who understands sort of what it means to be a black woman, what it means to 
um, grow up in the South, what it means to grow up in the church and, and learn how to be, because that was very much her story, mm -hmm. um, to understand the importance of community and aunties and uncles and protecting your neighbors, the folks around you. I think that resonated with her. Now, we didn't have, by the time it finished, we didn't have the best relationship. You know, putting your life story on the page and reading it back to yourself is not easy. It's mm -hmm. not an easy proposition. And at some point, you know, we bumped heads, but at the end of the day, we created something magical. It was really a beautiful book, and, um, and I'm very proud of it, and I, I hope that she is too. Wow, that's amazing. So now you've written about 23 books. Is it 23 or 24? There are 23 published, and there's two more coming out this year. Because, um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because so 25. <laughs> this year will be 25. Oh um, the, 20, the 24th is uh, Cookie Johnson. It's called Believing in Magic. I can't wait and, to read that. Um, it's such a beautiful book. Cookie is by far one of the sweetest people on the planet. Mm. She just has an amazing story of love, forgiveness, um, adversity, um, and overcoming and, and creating she, her own. I just love that she truly created her own brand, business, et cetera. Absolutely. At a time when everybody thought that a basketball's wife, a basketball wife's job was to just sit on the sidelines and cheer her man on. Exactly. And now she will tell you very quickly, like her job is to support her man. You know, that's what she truly believes deep down in her heart that she and her husband were put here by God to support one another. Mm. And, um, and that's a beautiful story to, you know, to tell too. Um, you know, she really does believe that being a wife and a mother was her part of her life's mission, mm -hmm. but she also understood the need to honor herself and to do what it is that she loves to do too. And that was fashion. And so she created her own fashion line and, you know, became a, a brand in her own right, which is a very beautiful story. And then the 20, you have to excuse me, but I'm battling a cold or trying to fight off the end of a cold. Oh, that's okay. So I apologize if I sound a little stuffy. Um, the 25th book is with Taraji Henson, who is a force in and of herself who just um, has this dogged determination to be the best at what, at her craft, to be the best artist that she can be. And her story is absolutely phenomenal. So that one is called Around the Way Girl. Mm -hmm. It's about her, you know, being around the way girl and becoming this, you know, A-list celebrity who is at the top of her game. She's pretty amazing. And Taraji is one of those people that we've loved forever like before everybody else you know what i mean it's no like we way love, we love taraji since you we know baby you boy yeah exactly <laughs> so it's just wonderful to see her getting all this shine right now and being i mean the reason i first watched empire was because she was on it i didn't even know what it was about right absolutely it's like oh taraji it was just like taraji has a show absolutely yvette she will be forever known by a lot of us not as cookie but as yvette, yvette. we've been rocking with her for a very long time and, you know, when we see her, it's just obvious. Yes, of course, I'm going to watch that because it's, you know, the girl from Baby Boy. <laughs> right. Exactly. So your, the other books that you've written, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, which is a New York Times bestseller. You co-wrote yes. with Steve Harvey. And uh, yes. I Am Charlie Wilson was a bestseller, too. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that was a story that I love to tell. Um, you know, love to write. It's, Charlie Wilson is just an incredible incredible story of, you know, just a spectacular rise and, at an early, early age and then a spectacular fall. Right, which and is very open to share. Absolutely. You know, being homeless, being addicted to cocaine and crack and marijuana and alcohol and, um, you know, not having a penny, you know, into his possession, you know, having his money stolen um, not getting getting the credit for the work that he created stolen and then being able to take that the dregs of what he what he was and being able to flip that and become a, a solo artist 
and to become this amazing force in the music industry at the age that he decided to do it is just an incredible story of of perseverance and will and beauty and it's all infused with a love of God like mm -hmm. you know he just even at his lowest he always always spoke to God and just asked God to protect him and you know it worked mm -hmm. God, God looked has. out for him right right Absolutely. So that was a beautiful story to tell. I really enjoyed talking to him. And, you know, every once in a while he would sing something, you know, and while he was explaining a story, he would sing. <laughs> just break my into song. Would, like, skip, you know, like, he just sang Outstanding to me, like my favorite song in the entire planet. <laughs> I love it. And he, and he would sing it, you know, and, and I just, you know, I'm sorry. I just have to have a fan <laughs> moment. Like, right. I just. Because that's my jam. Outstanding <laughs> is my jam. So he would just crack up and then sing some more. He's he's a good dude. That's awesome. Now, you seem to be the queen of collaborations. So many of your books are either you writing a memoir for someone, which obviously you collaborate with that person, or writing with people like Mitzi and Angela, and writing with your husband. You guys have done six books together. Yes, yes. So it's, it's fun to write with other people. I was going to ask you, what is that like? Because so many people would think I have to do this by myself. and But you just sort of, if not created, certainly embrace this other way of writing and creating work. So what is that like? I mean, you could build a house by yourself and take forever and, you know, struggle through getting the foundation to stand properly and, you know, holding up one side and trying to balance with the other. Or you can put some brilliant minds together, some creative minds together, some funny minds together, and do something special that um, pulls from all these different sources, all of these different personalities and experiences. And so the books that I wrote with Nick were very much sort of a, he, we created this format where it, where it was a he said, she said right. um, kind of format. So you got to look at these three relationship books that we created and then these three novels that created from two distinctly different perspectives from a man's perspective and a woman's perspective not saying that we were speaking on behalf of all black women and all black men or right. all women and all men but we had very unique perspectives on the way that a woman would look at a situation versus the way that a man would look at a situation and how the two of us could come together and solve whatever it was in relationships that needed to be solved and so that was interesting because, you know, like here I am married to this dude and there's just some things that I'm like, oh, I didn't know you thought that way. About right. And now that. you're reading it like, OK, right. Like, oh, OK. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this. But, you know, like you as a human being have the right to feel that way about it because we all bring our experiences and our flavor and, you know, like our family history and our personal human history to the way that we interact with one another. And so. It was just interesting to look at it from all those different angles. And then with creating with Mitzi and Angel was just fun because they're crazy as hell. So, <laughs> right. and <the> three <laughs> <of> you together. <laughs> so the three of us together was just like explosive. You know, uh, Mitzi is just a nutball. <laughs> I'm, you know, like sort of like the quiet, you know, and, and I know it doesn't sound that, that way right now, but. Of the three of us, I was just kind of sort of the quiet, you know, even peeled one. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Angela is the, she she can be, ex she's a quiet force who can be explosive when you need her to be explosive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you put those three together and you, and we created three different characters that were sort of emblematic of the kind of people that we are and also the kind of people we know. And, um... You know, we wrote uh, The Angry Black Woman's Guide to Life. Right, which is so which funny. Just, sort of just like foolish look at sort of the stereotypical ways that people look at black women as sort of these angry, you know, volatile beings who will blow, it, blow up at you at every second of the day. And we wanted to sort of flip that on its head and say, you know what, we're going to own this. And we're going to tell you all the ways that you need not misstep around us or we'll get you. Right. <laughs> so, or we will show you angry. I, exactly. Like, you don't know angry. Um, <laughs> that was like a humor book of us, the three of us being silly um, and sort of playing on our own personalities. And then Angela came up with this great idea. One day we were riding in the back of a cab from some meeting that we had with uh, about our um, about our first book. And she's like, what if we wrote a book about three women who make a deal at the stroke of midnight 
to be meet and marry the man of their dreams within a year. Mm-hmm. And all three was like, oh, hell yeah. So I took on one characteristic. Mitzi took on another characteristic. Angela took on another characteristic. And it was what would happen if these three women sort of use their friendship, their personalities, their influence, their background, their human history to try and find a man within a, meet and marry a man within a year. And The Vow was just an amazing, you know, funny, heartfelt book about friendship and relationships, love and relationships between men and women that actually ended up becoming a movie 10 years later. Right. I was going to ask you about that. That's just amazing. Yeah. It came on this last, was it last year or earlier this year? Time it goes was so fast. Last, last year. Right. Yep, January 2015. And it was called With This Ring on Lifetime. Yes, With This Ring starring, uh, Ange- um, I was going to say Angela Burt Murray. It was written <laughs> Angela Burt Murray. But starring Jill Scott, Regina Hall, and um, uh, Eve. Eve. Yeah. And Gabrielle Union, who was the producer. So it was that was an amazing experience. What to, was that journey like going from having the book written 10 years ago and then now it's become a movie? I mean, I know it was fantastic to experience it on Twitter with you guys and everyone else was all on black women on Twitter is just a force. It was so much. Absolutely. That was as much fun as watching it. And then it was directed by a black woman and Zynga. Yeah. So it was it was an entire team that Gabrielle Union built. And Gabrielle Union built that team from the moment that the book was published back in 2005. Mm -hmm. So it literally was a 10-year journey of Gabrielle deciding that she wanted to expand her business as an actress into producing. And so 2005, this was something that she was thinking, you know, like, I'm a, a fantastic actress and I have great opportunities, but I want to get on the business side of this. And so she hosted our, um, our book signing, uh, our debut. Um, it was at Da Silvano in 2005 in, I believe, August of 2005 or July, something like that. And she pulled us to the corner. She was like, I love this book. I love this book. She had 8 million questions about the characters. Like she, she legit read it. She didn't just show up and right, say, right. She didn't just read the back cover. Right. right. And take a picture and, you know, and move on. She actually read the book and she loved it. And she had very intense questions and deep questions that, you know, like at at some point I was like, ooh, I didn't really think of it that way. But okay. Right. You You could tell she had been thinking about the characters. Absolutely. And she was like, I really want to turn this book into a movie and I'm coming for this book. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, within a year, she did. She bought the rights to the book. And then she started assembling a team. She brought in Tracy Edmonds and um, her partner, Sheila. Um, oh, gosh, why do I want to call Sheila Stainback? That's not her last name. And I'm all in New York media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Sheila Stainback. It was Sheila. I will think of her name in two seconds. Um, but uh, her, her Tracy's partner, Sheila. And then, um, and then uh, sh- they found in Zynga. And then Zynga agreed to write the the screenplay. Mm-hmm. And then things fell apart. And then, you know, people found other projects to work on. And then they came back to it and bought the rights again. And then started assembling. Um, we originally wanted to do it on the big screen. But um, things, and we actually had a deal with Sony. And then that fell through. And so then we had to wait a couple more years. And it literally was 10 years. And then all out of the blue, it was like, you know what? We have, you know, Lifetime is on board, Sony is on board, and Zynga is on board. The screenplay is written. Uh, Sheila and and uh, Tracy are on board. Gabrielle's on board. Let's go. Right. And it sign these papers because we're ready to go. And it was literally a force of African American women leading the charge of this movie about African-American women starring three powerful African-American women. It was a black girl magic experience from beginning to the very end of the closing credits of the movie. Right. Um, that is something that I'm so very proud of because we just fly like that. We you know, just like- fly, exactly. 
was an amazing movie. It and was the a great fact movie. that it was a great movie, and the fact that over and it took ten years, or not took ten years, but the experience was ten years, and you all just stuck stuck with it. That just speaks Absolutely. to being an entrepreneur, or businesswoman, or anyone. Sometimes it doesn't happen within a year's time. Absolutely, but it happens. And Sheila Duxworth, I needed to find her name. <laughs> See, because, I saw you looking it up. Because, because, like she because she's right. Name. I'm gonna find her name because she deserves to be talked about. She's an amazing um, producer in her own right. And she works with Tracy, but she also does her own projects. And she was the one who just sort of insisted, no, this needs to be done. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and just carry the mantle and still calls to check in on us to see what we're working on and, and what we have planned. And, you know, perhaps one of these days we can work together again. I would really love that because she's an amazing woman. I love that. And now you have moved beyond just the writing portion of books. Speaking, you were talking about Gabrielle moving to the business side and you have launched your own imprint, which I'm so excited about. I have. Tell it's us Deneen, about that, Deneen Milner Books. Deneen Milner Books. So, you know, I've always loved children's books. I collect them, particularly African-American children's books. And when I see them, even though my babies are 17 and 14 right now, and I, I have a son it. 24, um, you know, I like, I love sort of the passion and energy and the innocence of children's books. And so I collect them. I love specifically the images that we create for black children and um, being able to read that and see the, the sort of sparkle in a child's eyes when you read them a story that they really love and that they can see themselves in. And so I've had stories floating in my head forever, mm -hmm. children's book stories, and I've written six of them. Um, uh, I ghost wrote one of them for um, a civil rights icon. Mm -hmm. And then I did two others for other people. Um, uh, well, one other for, for Holly Robinson Pete. I wrote her book, My Brother Charlie, for her and her daughter. Mm -hmm. And then I did one of my own uh, with Scholastic. Scholastic has this series called the Candy Apple series. And it's like a series that's made for tweens and different authors write each one of the books. And mine was number 27, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was the first one to feature an African-American character as the lead um, out of 27 books. Girl. 27. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, that one called, that one is called Miss You Nina. But I, I had all of these different stories in mind about black children that aren't sort of rooted to slavery or civil rights movement or jazz icons or sports icons, um, which tend to be sort of the flavor of books for black children. Mm -hmm. And I'm not taking away from the fact that there are books that don't sort of, you know, glom into those specific subjects, but there's way more books with those subjects than there are just the everyday life of children. So like my kids, Every, they know about the civil rights movement, but that's not what we talk about every day with them. Right. My they're being kids, children. They're being kids. They're outside in the park playing, swinging on swings. They're throwing a ball with their dad. They're swimming in the pool. They're, you know, cooking with me in the kitchen. They're nervous when they get on the bus for the first time. They're, you know, nervous when they lose their first tooth and anxious when the tooth fairies come in. They're excited when Santa's come in. You know, like they're excited about taking their first birthday bike ride. Right. They love their community. They love going to Harlem and looking at the shops and, and the community that's there and the people. They love their aunties and their uncles and their grandparents. And they're not always talking about the ugly side of, of um, what it means to be African American in America. They're, they're thinking about the beautiful part of being humans mm. and a very specific way of being a human that involves culture and music and art and things that are special to us. And so I wanted to write those kinds of stories for other kids because I know my kids aren't the only ones. Right. And, um, and I just couldn't get any traction in the publishing industry for those kinds of stories. And so I was like, oh, so you don't want to publish this story that I created that has a kid being normal and doing average, normal, everyday black girl things? Right. I'll do it myself I'll then. create my own, <laughs> which is what we do. Right. Okay. Bet. Deneen Milner Books will be born. And so um, my husband had written a book with Agate Publishing, which is a small press out of Chicago, mm -hmm. small but powerful 
Mighty Force um, that uh, focuses on publishing books by and for African Americans. And so uh, the publisher, Doug Seibold, came to Atlanta to meet with Nick, and we all went to dinner, and I showed up with an idea to you know, partner with him to do some children's books, and he came to the table ready to ask me if I would be interested in doing a children's book line with him. So we kind of showed up to the table with Did the same know, idea. Did you know, though, you both just had ended up, no. showing, it just aligned like that? Which it's is- just aligned like that. Like, mm. he came to the table ready to talk about that. I came to the table ready to talk about that. And neither one of us knew that we were thinking about that. Very interesting. Yeah. And so um, it was, it was started, we started building right there at that, that dinner table And then after about a year and a half of talking about it and trying to, you know, build the foundation, we announced it um, in February of this year. And our first books will be coming out in February of next year or March of next year. That's amazing. Congratulations. I cannot wait to support by my goddaughter and all the other babies in my life. That's going to be. Please. Yes. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Please. That's wonderful. So I only have a couple more questions. I want to be conscious of your time. Um, so something you do occasionally is you post notes to yourself from the universe on social yes. media. And one that you posted on June 9th, because I was stalking you, um, <laughs> said, sometimes when you're feeling your lowest, Deneen, the real you is summoned. So I want to ask you, who is the real you, the real Deneen? And when she's at her lowest, who who is she? Hmm. Um, so those, those notes from the universe, I can't claim writing those. Those come from Tut. Oh, I get those too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when you put your own sort of, uh, uh, sort of background into, um, what it is that you want them to spit back out at you, um, that come to me. And, um, when I'm feeling at my lowest, that, that, T- tell me what it what it said again, because I want to be really specific about how I answer the question. Sure thing. It says, um, let's see, sometimes when you're feeling your lowest, Deneen, the real you is summoned. Right. And then there was more there, but that I thought was right. very interesting. Right. Um, so, you know, like I, I've, I've had, again, some low moments with self-esteem, with trusting that I know what I'm doing, um, trusting that no matter how other people feel about me, I'm still my authentic self. And that's when I need to be my most authentic self and learn how to, um, to honor that. And I think that that is something that I've just learned how to do with age and maturity, right? So I'll be 48 this year in October. Mm. And I'm not the same person that I was when I was 40. I am definitely not the same person that I was when I was 34 and had my my first baby or my second baby. I'm not the same person I was when I had my first baby at 30. I'm not the same person I was at 25 walking into the offices of the Daily News, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, right. looking to cover David Dinkins as a political reporter. I've evolved and grown and changed in the way that I look at life and the way that I look at who I am and my interaction with other people has changed. Um, the way that I look at my own talents has changed. The way that I look at um, you know, how other people perceive me has changed. And I would say that at my lowest, the thing that I, I, I remember about myself is that I'm worthy. Mm. You know, I'm worthy of being exactly who I want to be. I, it, this is a very short life. It is, in the scheme of the universe, we are alive for a very blink of an eye. Right. Not even that. And it is on us to do with our lives what we will, what pleases us. Within reason, there's no reason to hurt other people while we're doing it. But it is on us to sit outside on the porch like I am right now right. and enjoy, you know, just the beauty and listen to birds sing. It is our duty to look up and notice the sky. I sit here every day and I look at the sky right there, change colors. I watch the sunset every night with a glass of wine and some music playing. Mm-hmm. I might be listening to Kirk Franklin and catching the Holy Ghost by myself sitting right here on the porch, just listening to people minister to me 
through music, or I might listen to D'Angelo and be ministered in a whole nother way. Right. Or I might listen to Rihanna and, you know, hear, you know, her saying, be better have my money and <laughs> be ministered to in a whole nother way, you know, but, um, I think it's my duty as a human being when I'm at my lowest to understand that the world is so much bigger than this very moment that is making me feel this way. It is my duty to feel what it is that I'm feeling, not to try and push away the sadness, not to push away the anger, not to pretend like it's not there because I was very good at doing that putting my head down and pretending like I don't feel you hurting me, Mm. putting my head down and pretending like I don't feel you making fun of me or I don't feel you disrespecting me. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Um, But now I allow myself to feel that and to say, Hey, that hurts. Right. I'm going to feel this hurt and you're going to know that you're hurting me. And then I'm going to sit here and understand that the world is so much bigger than this moment. I can feel this moment, but then I have to understand that there are so many more other beautiful moments that will make me feel great. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that moment when I feel my best. So that's what I have to remember about myself, that I'm just a blink of an eye, a very small part of this universe. And in my little teeny weeny part of this universe, it's my duty to make myself happy. I'm getting teary just thinking about it because it (laughs) it makes me happy to be happy yeah it's taken almost 48 years to get to this place where I understand that and I, I I talk to my daughters about it all the time because I didn't come from a background where um where this was a black woman's way Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of moved with um, a cape with a cross and you walked with that and it didn't matter if you were happy so long as everybody around you was happy. Mm-hmm. And so I'm constantly trying to let my daughters know that it's important that they find their happiness, that they understand that they have to put themselves first. They don't have to wait until they're 48 to figure that out. Right. And I'm so happy to share that with them. I'm so happy to share that with me because for so long I didn't. I'm sorry to end this crying. No, that's okay. It's beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing that. I really wanted to to touch on that. And I couldn't have imagined how you would have responded, but it was a great response and important for all of us to remember, right? Finding our happy and that we have a choice, right? Like you said, expressing when you are hurt, that's a choice because I've done the same thing. You just bury it. And then in the happy moments, you can't fully even enjoy it because there's still some pain there. So it goes so deep. That could be a whole other, we'll have to do a second show. (laughs) Absolutely, for sure. So thank thank you so much. So closing and wrapping up, I just ask one other question. If you think over your life and career and you had a chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would it be and what would you say? Oh, gosh. Oh, that's my dad. And I tell him this every day. Every time I talk to him, I tell him, you know, Daddy, I just appreciate you for always being in my corner and for always being the one who um, said that I could do it, you know. Well, what you, you, okay. I, you're not good at, at math and science, but what can you do? You're really good at, at, at you're cute. You can, you can <laughs> really do what Sue Simmons does. So go do that. I know you can do it. You have it within you to do whatever you want to do. Um, I, you know, like when I'm on my way to a meeting to meet another celebrity and consider doing a book with them. Oh, I really love that person. Like I went to a meeting the other day and I was like, I don't know if I want to do this book because I don't, I don't know enough about this person or, and I don't know if if we're going to vibe in a way that I need to vibe in order to create this art. And he was like, I really like him. He's funny. Mm -hmm. And it was like, Oh, okay. Let me think about it. Open my head in a different kind of way. Okay. He's funny. I'm going to go ahead and do this. And sure enough, you know, my dad just sort of opens my eyes to the possibilities without questioning me at all like there's never a question about what i can and cannot do he tells me to run and i take off full speed Mm. and that has been my life 
from the moment that we've been together. Daddy says run, I take off. Right. And you know, that that's who you need in your corner. That's my daddy. I love it. And lastly, do you have any parting piece of advice for our audience? Mm, I would say um, what I always say to people who say that they want to write, and this goes for anybody who wants to do whatever it is that they're passionate about doing. If you are serious about it, know your craft. You know, if you're for me, I'm going to talk specifically about writing because that's what I do. Oh, the sun is in your face. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Actually, the sun, it's funny. I was going to tell you after this, but the sun came right across you when you were talking before about getting through your lowest points. Oh, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but I was just like, oh my gosh, the sun is shining on her. She talks about happiness. I was going to tell you after, but it just that's was perfect. Uni- that's the universe. Exactly. It was just like right across your face. It's beautiful. Um. But, you know, like when when you're writing, it's your duty to read. It's your duty to look at how people put a sentence together. It's your duty to sit every day and exercise that muscle, your brain and your ability to tell a story or to retell someone else's story. You have to consistently practice your art, whether it's, you know, painting a picture, fixing a car um, creating widgets, uh, running a restaurant, you have to study how to do that and do it well so that you can see the things that you would want to change for the better so that you could see the mistakes that people make. So you try not to make those so that you can make mistakes and figure out how to fix it so that you can become an expert at what it is that you want to do. You can't do any of that blindly. And Mm -hmm. so you have to, if you have a passion, you have to study that passion and then figure out from that study how to do it in a way that pleases you the most. So if there's anything that I could possibly tell anyone about how to do what it is that they do, it's to study your craft. I love it. Deneen, thank you so much. This was so wonderful. I'm going to get from you afterwards all the links and things that we can send people to find out more about you and to be in touch with you and to find out about Deneen Milner books. But I just so appreciate you and you sharing and being so open this morning. I really, I love it. Thank you thank so, you. so thank much. You so on. much. I love you. Love okay, you. Love you. I love you. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to my website, elainefluker.com slash podcast. So that's E-L-A-Y-N-E. F-L-U-K-E-R dot com slash podcast. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I'd love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.